Morning, Faith Church. We're glad you're here this morning. We're also glad that you join us online this morning. Um, let's all stand together as we get ready to worship. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Those of you online can feel free to share some um, praises and concerns with us online uh, through the chat. And just to say hello to us this morning, we, we'd love to hear from you. And everybody in person, before we start this morning, let's just turn to your neighbor this morning, if you're comfortable doing that, and uh, say hello to them this morning. We sing, your love awakens me. Praise God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for an awesome day. Thank you for the, the rain that you've given us. Thank you for just the reminder of your love and your faithfulness uh, through the storms. And we look forward to today, what you have to teach us, uh, that we can grow close to you and follow your plan for our lives. And we love you. We give it to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. If there are any kids here, you guys can come on up for the children's message. <laughs> huh? 
All right. Good morning, guys. All right. So, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Many people enjoy boating or fishing, sailing or maybe even canoeing, whether on lakes, rivers, or in oceans. It's important to have a flotation device, just like this one. Has you guys ever seen something like this before? Yeah. A flotation device can be a life jacket or what some people call a lifesaver. They're important even for good swimmers because if an accident happens, a flotation device like a life jacket can save your life. Have any of you guys ever used one before? A life jacket or something when you've gone to the lake? No? No? Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Never. No. I once heard a story about some people who went fishing on a big lake. Before they left, everyone got their life jackets and were ready to go. That is, except one man who didn't want to wear one. Well, after they went out on that big lake, a storm came. The wind blew. Can you guys make wind noises for me? <whistles> Lost. That's, a, that's a good one. And the waves came up into the boat. Can you guys make big wave crashing sounds? <laughs> they became so high that they turned over the boat. <gasps> Can you guys gasp? <laughs> the people who were wearing life jackets made it to shore and were saved, but the man who didn't want to wear his life jacket sadly drowned. The man could have been saved had he chosen to take that life jacket he so needed. The story reminds us of something the Bible tells us. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is our life jacket. God sent him to earth to save us through his death and resurrection we can be forgiven and have eternal life with God. All we have to do is believe and accept Jesus as our Savior. We'll still face storms, but when we do, we'll have our life jacket. Jesus is our lifesaver. It's foolish to go out onto the water without a life jacket, but it's even more foolish to try to sail the sea of life without Jesus. Will you guys please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I know you sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us. I pray that each and every one of us here today will take hold of the one thing that we can save, Jesus, our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So while we welcome up Cherry Whitley to pray over BBS this week, I just want to let everyone know we have 75 kids signed up this year, which is super exciting. <laughs> so we had 45 on average last year, so we have increased our numbers, which is amazing. So I'll hand it over to Cherry. Hi, guys. It's so good to see everybody. Good to see you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to pray for BBS this week. Okay, Vacation Bible School. Okay, pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the willing hands and hearts to plan this. Lord, please bless these children that come and help us to be the hands and feet. Help them to feel you, to see you, Lord, and help all of the volunteers to be blessed. Lord, may you be shown through this week. Amen. And anybody that was thinking of volunteering, it's not too late. Lindsay's here. She'll be happy to talk to you at the end. Anybody whose kids are not registered at home or here, everybody's welcome. When does it start? What time? It starts tomorrow at 530 and it ends at 7. At 730. Show up tomorrow. Uh, try and be here by five. We'd like to have as many adults here as possible for early children arrivers. We had lots last year, so just letting you know. <laughs> All right, you guys can be dismissed with me, and we're gonna head back to Faith Community. And on the way out, we will sing "Jesus Loves Me." Come on, Jesus loves me. Well, that was great. We had an unintentional round there, people. That was, that was good singing. <laughs> I should have stood up and led or something. I'm Matt Smith. I'm the pastor here at Faith. So good to be with you. Uh, for those who are 
worshiping in person is kind of a little bit of a dreary summer morning, so thank you for coming out and making that effort. For those of you worshiping at home, hope that you're having a good morning as well, and hope that you'll be blessed by what we experience here today. Again, could not be more excited to be hosting Vacation Bible School. You probably heard Lindsay say that we have 75 kids signed up, and so we're just thrilled with that. The halls, if you're here in person, you know this. They've already been transformed. There's vines a-hanging and all sorts of stuff for the beach. And if you're at home, I pray that you'll join us. And, and everybody, even if you can't come out uh, these evenings, you're welcome to stay after worship if you're here and help them decorate. They're going to be putting up yet more decorations to welcome the kids and make this a very exciting week so we can use all hands on deck after the service today. So everybody is invited to be part of that. Um, I just uh, wanted to, you know, hear from people we haven't done this in a while about any joys and concerns that might be on your uh, hearts and minds today that you might want to celebrate or that you might want to, uh, yeah, the concerns that you might want others to lift in prayer this morning. Uh, Kevin, you got one? Oh, okay. Kevin and Stacy celebrating 29 years. That's awesome. Did you have one, Matt? Did you raise your hand? Yeah. So Matthew Kirkland asked for prayers for his grandfather who's experiencing uh, cognitive decline, some dementia, and prayers that things would, would go as well as possible for him. Right, right prayers for you and for all who love him and are having that going on that journey with him others yeah well hey Cheryl okay wonderful so Cheryl celebrates the the, the wedding of her daughter and uh she got a, a, a son-in-law, a, a son out of the bargain that's just great. And so <laughs> she's, she's, she's working those connections as the mother-in-law and, and putting them to good use. Yeah, hey, Paul. Paul, Paul asked for prayers in the, in the death of his good friend, Tim Forrester. Um, other joys, concerns, anything on your hearts and minds this morning that you want to bring before God in prayer? Uh, prayers are welcome for uh, Kelly Baglivo. Uh, her parents are in bad shape, and, uh, you know, that she's went down to Georgia to tend to them, and... Uh, yeah, lots of things to, for her to sort out and to try to help from afar. As some of you know, that's a hard thing to do. Okay, well, let's turn to God in prayer. We thank you, God, uh, for this day and for this place and every day that comes as a gift from you that even if it's gray and gloomy and, and humid and raining, that it's still a day that you have made and that there are still blessings to be found in it. We pray a prayer of rejoicing with all those who are rejoicing with the, the, the celebrations that have been lifted. We, we pray prayers of concern with all those who uh, are having things that are, that are hard and unwelcome put on their plate and, and tough journeys and, and griefs and losses of every sort. Uh, we, we give thanks that, uh, that we can bring those, that we, uh, that we belong to a community of, of love and support. Um, where we know that we're not in life's challenges alone, that we have one another, that we have you, that your love for us never fails, that your love for us as expressed in the death and resurrection of Jesus is stronger than any challenge that we're going to face. We pray, O oh Lord, uh, as Sherry did, that as the kids come in this week, as their parents, their families 
come in, that they'll be touched by this great love that you have for us in Jesus, and that having experienced it uh, through us this week, that they might want to experience that kind of community of love and forgiveness on a regular basis. So, gosh, we don't want to take anybody away from the churches of which they're already a part, but if those, those that are coming this week who have no church, we pray that this might become their church and that you might grow us in numbers and spirit in being able to host this wonderful event. Give thanks for all those, uh, particularly Lindsay, who are working so hard to prepare and uh, pray that we will be, uh, the kids, the families all involved will be tremendously blessed. We ask all this in the name and spirit of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand together and sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right. We've got uh, just a few more things I wanted to celebrate this morning, uh, announcements to give. Uh, one is a, a few of our youth from our combined youth group are away this weekend at a spiritual treat in Black Mountain called Fuge, so prayers for them are welcome. But for those youth who are still here, uh, you're welcome to join us this evening at Bolero Lanes. We're going to meet out there at 545 for 6 o'clock bowling time. Um, it's uh, 11,210 11, Brigman Road in Matthew. So come on out to Bolero Lanes. Uh, $10 will get you a couple games and shoe rentals. The churches will subsidize the rest and everybody. Come on out and be a part of that if you can. Um, it's helpful if you'll let us know. Uh, by the end of this service if you're uh, planning to attend. So thanks for that. Um, also prayers are welcome for uh, Keith Manus. So one of the pastors in our group of churches is away. Norma is on that spiritual retreat. And so Keith Manus is preaching this morning at Zion United Methodist. So prayers for them and for their worship service are welcome. Uh, the women started their new class, uh, a book by Jenny Allen, Get Out of Your Head. Uh, Mary, did you have a good first session? 12 people, yeah. Two more coming. So I think they could squeeze yet more women in that room. So if you're available Tuesday at 10, what a turnout for that, that day and time. So come on out and join them. It's not too late. Uh, they got six weeks to uh, look at the book of Philippians and how you can turn your thinking around and get it going in a positive way. So finally, I want to mention uh, kids are probably not wanting to think about this, but it's not that long till the summer winds down and the kids will be going back to school. And so one of the most prized things always for me was to be able to go in and maybe have a new backpack and plenty of clean supplies and to go in there, maybe a new outfit, a new pair of shoes, right? But not all kids have that privilege, do they? So uh, a group of churches started an effort almost 10 years ago called the Union County Back to School Bash. And so they take over Carolina courts. Uh, they give those kids a new backpack with clean supplies, a new pair of shoes, and just a blessing as they start their new school year. For all those kids who can't uh, afford it, they'll, make, they'll find a way. They'll find the funds to do this for 800 to 1,000 kids every year. So, if you are interested in being part of that, um, well, one thing, you're already a part of it because our church is one of the sponsoring churches, and so we have sent a contribution of $500 to help them buy those supplies and shoes for all those kids, right? So, thanks for being part of it in that way. 
Uh, if you need to be the recipient of those, you can sign up through our church website. We'll link you to there where you can sign up to register if you need to receive. But you can also sign up there if you'd like to volunteer. We'd like to get a group of 20 or more from Faith Church to be out there and to be uh, celebrating and blessing others, blessing these kids and their families as they head back to school. So if you can do that on Sunday afternoon, August the 7th, sign up. The, our church website will take you there. All right. But all that we do, all the good uh, that we, we seek to do is only in response to how good God has been to us. And one of the ways that we give back uh, week after week is through the offering of our tithes and, and our gifts to God. So we would invite the ushers to come forward at this time and to help lead us in that. In this time of desperation, all we know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation we believe, we believe. And in this broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthem. Greater than the songs we sing. and temptations we believe let's stand sing this together we believe Amen. You can be seated.
one more, uh, we were doing joys and concerns earlier, one more praise that came through the lines was from uh, Sam and Melody Stifler. They had a great time taking winter on a, a big family vacation, and she got to meet a lot of her family for the first time, and great celebrations there, and, and just, uh, they had a wonderful trip, and look forward to being back with us in person, so we'll add that to the praises for the day. Well, again, uh, in case you joined us late, my name's Matt Smith. I'm the pastor here at Faith. So glad to be with you today. And um, I listen to pop radio. I'm not terribly proud of this or terribly ashamed. It's just a thing to know about me. Uh, one of the most surprising hits that's been on the radio this year has been Cold Heart. Does anybody know this one? This is kind of a, a mashup of the song Sacrifice and Rocket Man that were sung by Sir Elton John originally, and now he's added the voice of Dua Lipa. So on the surface, this is not a pairing of artists that would seem to work. Elton John is 75 now, if you can believe that. Dua Lipa is 26. They don't seem to have much of an overlapping fan base. One perhaps can easily understand why an up-and-coming pop star might want to team up with a veteran singer. But what does Elton John get out of the deal, besides a truckload of money and the opportunity to continue to still be relevant? What well, seems what mo motivated Elton John the most is that he's a fan. He's a fan of Dua Lipa. Unlike some other classic artists that can get a little snobby and crotchety in their old age, Elton isn't convinced that his generation's music is superior to all others. He genuinely enjoys new artists and new music. He's collaborated with several younger artists over the years, helping to bring them success or maybe turn things around for them at pivotal moments in their career. I remember one time years ago that the rapper Eminem had gotten into trouble for some homophobic things that he had said. And it seemed like just days later that Elton John, who's gay, came and sang a duet with him at the Emmys. Uh, at the Grammys, rather. And the performance helped to smooth over the rapper's comments and, and demonstrate maybe that he had had a change of heart. I mean, if I were Elton John, I might not have taken that call, much less joined Eminem on stage, but that's what he did. Maybe it was a PR stunt, but maybe he was genuinely touched and he wanted to help a younger artist out. The idea of an older artist older musician making way for and encouraging and supporting younger musicians reminds me of the relationship between two first century churches whose stories we can piece together from the New Testament book of Acts. From the examples of these churches and others, we can learn many things about how we can be the best church that we can be here in the 21st century. If you're with us last week, you may remember how I said that one church depicted in the New Testament seems to be the total package. Does anybody remember where that church was? Anybody remember the church at Antioch in Syria, right? If, if, if you use my analogy of pop music, Antioch is the Dua Lipa character in this analogy, right? Their star is on the rise. Antioch's the first church where Jesus' followers were called Christians, and they were the pace setters in many other ways. The folks from that church are exceptionally generous. They're exceptionally forgiving. They're exceptionally diverse. Antioch has a depth of worship and devotion and a matchless heart for sending people out in mission, right? Antioch is the church to be, we said. Whereas a few individual Gentile converts have been made in other places, Antioch in Syria was the first church to embrace an intentional outreach strategy to the Gentiles. They believed and taught that you didn't first have to become a Jew in order to follow Jesus. But that wasn't the consensus position everywhere, right? Acts 15 tells us that while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea, that's where Jerusalem is, they, they arrived and they began to teach the believers Unless you are circumcised as required in the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Right? They came in, they tried to start teaching this stuff. And Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. 
Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. This was the biggest dispute in the first century. Whether and under what terms were they going to accept Gentiles? Did Gentiles need to become Jews first to follow Jesus? Did they need to keep kosher? Did they need to obey the Sabbath? Did they need to practice circumcision? And the stakes of what they were asking were not only theological but practical. It was the line of adult men who wanted to undergo circumcision was not lining up around the block. <laughs> the only place that had the authority to settle this dispute is the church where it all began in Jerusalem. It was here in King David's royal city that Jesus had uh, ended his ministry in such a powerful climax when he had died and was resurrected and where the believers first experienced the gift of the Holy Spirit giving birth to the church. Miracles were common in those early days in Jerusalem. In the early stages, at least, they shared their wealth and their possessions radically so that no one had need. The Jerusalem church was still headed by two of Jesus' closest followers, Peter and John, as well as Jesus' brother, James. In my pop music analogy, the church in Jerusalem is like Elton John, right? He's been the star, right? And now someone else is coming along. Acts 15.3 says, The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them much to everyone's joy that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted that Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders got together to settle this issue. Many people, as you can see, share Barnabas and Paul's enthusiasm that the Gentiles are coming to faith. Right? And, and they're agreeing with Paul and Barnabas that they don't first have to become Jews. Paul and Barnabas don't pretend to be neutral on this question. It, it sounds like they're trying to persuade as many people as possible on their way there to, to encourage them to get support. And their opponents, converted Pharisees who continue to zealously follow the letter of God's law, they're on their own mission to win friends and influence people. Sometimes you run into folks these days who stopped participating in a church because they found it too political. If by that they mean too closely identified with one or another political party or individual, I'd agree with them. But if they mean that the church is a place where people have strongly held perspectives about who we should be and what we should do, perspectives of which they try and convince one another, I'd suggest the church has always been political in that sense. Hopefully our motives are good. Hopefully our tactics, tactics are above board, as Paul and Barnabas's were. But as long as we have people and decisions to make, the church will always have a political dimension in that sense of the word. And if there's a church where everyone agrees about everything, they're probably not asking very important questions, right? Thankfully, they're probably being too timid in following Jesus. But thankfully, Paul and Barnabas were not timid, and they were not alone either in their testimony that God was causing great things to happen among the Gentiles. In chapter 10 of Acts, we're told of this really kind of strange story about a vision that Peter had while daydreaming on the roof one afternoon. Pete envisions a sort of buffet line in the sky, with all kinds of birds and animals and creeping things that good Jewish boys never ate due to the Old Testament's dietary laws. And soon after he sees this vision of the animals descending from the cloud, Peter got an invitation to go to the home of a Roman officer named Cornelius in order to share the good news with him. Peter starts to put two and two together. He says this crazy vision that he had was God's way of preparing him to stay at Cornelius' house. God didn't want the strange things Peter might be served for dinner 
to stand in the way of his commitment to share Christ with his hosts, with this Roman officer and his family. And it was a good thing too. Peter went. He shared the good news with Cornelius. And not only Cornelius, but his whole household, all his family, all his servants were baptized, and all of them exhibited signs of the Holy Spirit. Right? This helps us understand what Peter's position at the Jerusalem conference, where he said, listen, God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between them and us, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither us nor our ancestors were able to bear? What's the yoke that no one's been able to bear? Well, it's the law. Peter says that full weight of the law to be circumcised, to obey kosher, the other 613 laws that, that make up what an ethical person is supposed to do according to the Old Testament. He says if lifelong Jews like us haven't been able to perfectly follow this law, how in the world are we going to expect some Gentile who just heard about it to follow all those rules? Right? Why would we make them do something we've never been able to do? Peter says adherence to the law is no longer what counts most, right? He says that believers in Jesus Christ, be they Jews or Gentiles, are now subject to grace instead of the law. And Peter concludes his speech by saying, we believe we're saved the same way they are, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus, right? That's how we're saved, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus, it was only after Peter's forceful testimony, his powerful conclusion, that the leaders in Jerusalem heard from Paul and Barnabas. Everyone listened quietly, we're told, as the two men told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And I think it's worth saying here that Paul never set out in his own heart of hearts to be the foremost apostle to the Gentiles. That was God's choice. Whenever Paul and his traveling partners traveled to a new area to begin sharing the news, they tried to start by going to the synagogue, the center of Jewish teaching in an area. And you'll remember that Paul and all the original disciples and Jesus himself, they were all Jews. Paul would make some progress when he would go to these new towns and helping people see Jesus as Israel's Messiah, but many people would lose their interest when he told them about how God had raised Jesus from the dead. They couldn't comprehend it. Others were led astray by false teachers who stirred up opposition. Paul would find a better audience among the Gentiles. The Gentiles responded to the good news in great numbers to everyone's surprise and more than a little confusion. As time progressed, the church would become almost exclusively Gentile, and that was a mystery that Paul and others struggled to understand. But eventually, the conclusion Paul came to is that Jewish rejection of Jesus spelled Gentile opportunity. Right? If the Jews had just accepted Jesus, right, he could have been their Messiah, but the movement wouldn't have gone much further than that. But by their rejection... It opened this door, and that too, Paul thinks, must be part of God's plan. You know how they say, when God closes a door, he opens a window? Comedian Daniel Tosh says that's why God's power bills are so high. <laughs> but that's kind of the, the scenario that's going on here, right? If the Jews had more broadly accepted Jesus as the Messiah, the, the movement Jesus began would have had a much narrower scope. The door to the Gentiles would never have been as thrown as wide as it was. So Paul and others became convinced that this too was part of God's plan. And James, who I said is there, one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, he's the brother of Jesus, he shares Paul's understanding of how this turn of events must be part of God's providence. And he, he's putting two and two together as well, right? And Acts 15 says that the Gentiles' reception of the gospel 
In fact, it's just something that's been predicted by the prophets from the Old Testament, like Amos and Isaiah. So James says, when it's his turn to speak in Jerusalem, that when Paul and Barnabas had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter's told you about the, first, the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted, as it's written. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who has made these things known so long ago. So here he is. He's, he's justifying this brand, seemingly brand new mission to the Gentiles by looking back at these ancient texts, 600 or year, more years old, and saying this is what the prophets have been telling us was going to happen all along. And, and here, here it is, yet again, we have another example from the book of Acts of something that seems unfortunate, disappointing, or even tragic, that gets turned into something very positive by the creative power of the Holy Spirit. It should have been terrible news that more Jews didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. But instead, it was good news for you and me. Now, Christ can be the Savior of the world. The whole reason that we're here on this Sunday morning or, or tuned in from home, right, is because of what happened at this conference nearly 2,000 years ago where the people realized that God was overcoming this negative development of the Jewish rejection of Jesus and turning it into something very positive. The Holy Spirit was, was at work. And the Holy Spirit was leading the church to cast as broad a net as possible when it came to sharing the Christian faith. and To share it with the whole world without reservations. The Holy Spirit was also at work in leading James to say one more pivotal thing with a wisdom and authority that everyone who heard it accepted. James says, And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. So, I don't know if you caught this here, but it's nothing short of miraculous that James, being a devout Jew, is willing to set aside 1,500 years of religious and moral practices to acknowledge that God is doing a new thing. Right? It's not just a tradition they started last week that they're setting aside, right? This is what it meant to be a good person. This is what it meant to be a moral person. This is what it meant to be a holy person. This is what it meant to be God's people. And James, in his wisdom, says, you've got to set that aside because God is clearly doing a new thing. So tell the Gentiles to avoid the things associated with pagan sacrifices and unbridled lust. James is willing to let go, though, of, of circumcision, of, of dietary laws, of rules about cleanliness, of anything that served to keep Jews from freely associating with Gentiles. He was even willing to let go of the Ten Commandments. I kind of wish he'd kept the Ten Commandments. I was talking to Mary about this this morning, but at least in James' recollection of what's most important, this is what he says. He doesn't want to make it too hard on the Gentiles who are coming to faith. It's such an important decision that James made. He made it easy for everyone to believe. And so should we. Right? If somebody comes to us in our church, right, and we have some question about whether they should be welcome as they are, do they, do they carry a coffee in sanctuary? Right? Do they, do they wear funny clothes? Have they got something pierced? Have they got a tattoo somewhere where you wouldn't put one? Who cares? Why, why should we not be willing to set aside our little petty biases if James was willing to set aside 1,500 years 
or what it meant to be God's people. Right? Let's not make it hard for people to believe. Amen? Amen. And the others at Jerusalem, to their credit, they ratified that decision. They sent Paul and Barnabas and the others back to Antioch with blessings on their mission to the Gentiles. The spread of Christianity from that point around the world was nothing short of miraculous. And because of what was decided in Jerusalem at that conference, now 2.6 billion people call themselves Christian, a third of the world's population. And it would not have been nearly that fraction had they come to some other conclusion. Had James instead said, no, let's make it pretty hard to believe. Let's set the bar, the bar really high, as some wish they would. And there's something else that struck me reading this story this time that never has before, but and I don't know the degree to which the Christians in Jerusalem understood it at the time, but the church where they were either was or soon would be on the decline, right? Again, Jewish people are not converting in great numbers. The, the ones who, who have come to faith in Christ are, are finding themselves more ostracized from their families and their communities, less able to do business, right? They're going to be a shrinking community until the church in Jerusalem does not exist anymore. And what they did that day may have, in fact, accelerated that decline by not clinging to the power that they might have had. They wouldn't have been able to reverse things. They wouldn't have really been able to change the trajectory that they were going to be on. But they could have made it harder. They could have clung a little harder to their tradition, their practices, their power. But they didn't. They just let it go. And they let these people go with their blessing to make disciples in their way. Right? The churches that were made up of and seeking to reach Gentiles, they were the ones that were going to be growing in spirit and numbers. And there's probably, again, nothing that James and the others could have done to resist that eventuality. But I give thanks that they didn't insist that that Paul and Barnabas and the others didn't make Christians everywhere say they have to do it exactly like they did in Jerusalem. They could have made a power play, right? They could have slightly postponed their own irrelevance, but they didn't. Instead, they were like the old musicians that make way for the new ones. They were like the relay racers who run their hearts off, run their hearts out, right? Just the hand of baton to someone else who's going to be the one to see the finish line. And they were people who believed very much in our Lord Jesus Christ and what he said, that unless a seed falls into the ground and it dies, it remains but a seed. But if it does its job, if it falls and is willing to die, then it bears a great harvest. Amen. Let's all stand together and worship together in Christ today. Yeah.
Won't you pray with me? We give you thanks, for God, for your enduring love, uh, which has existed uh, before we ever began to recognize it, before we did the first thing to respond to it, which greets us so happily when we turn to you in faith and which helps to shape us and grow us as your disciples each and every day. We pray, O oh Lord, that as, uh, as our friends back in Jerusalem did so long ago, we might do all in our power to make it easy for others to believe the great good news of what you've done for us in Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. It's in his name we gather, in his name we pray. Amen. We are uh, so glad for all of you who are here, especially anybody who might be new. And uh, if you are relative new to us, uh, please stop by our newcomers table there in the lobby. Uh, if you're new to us online, please reach out to us here at the church so that we might, uh, we might thank you for participating with us in that way. Everybody, just on the, it's worth introducing yourself to somebody on your way out of the sanctuary today. If you haven't yet met them or you haven't seen them in a while, be sure to catch up with uh, not only the, the great friends you have already, but the great friends you'll make it here at Faith Church. Um, do remind you that uh, for all who are able to stay and help, that we've got some decoration for Vacation Bible School to be done. So please join us for that as you're able. And come back next week where uh, the Apostle Paul gets his mind expanded even further about the scope of who, uh, who might be the recipients of the good news as he, uh, as he uh, has a vision that he's going to go meet a man from Macedonia and there's no man there. So join us for that and we pray that you go in God's blessings and peace and so that we might live in such a way that it makes it easier for others to believe. Jerry's going to remind us of our uh, marching orders as we Amen. go. Let's raise them together. We believe, believe the, the good, good news. news. We are transformed by the good news and we will proclaim the good news. God bless you. Have an awesome week.